How's everybody's week? We good? Yeah? yeah? Kurt's the only one with a good week, apparently. Um, all of you, Kirk's going to lay hands on you at the end of service. Uh, welcome to Takeout. We're going to be jumping back into the book of Ezra tonight. Uh, we have, uh, no, we didn't. We didn't. Last week was Rebecca Rogers. So how many were here last week? It was great. Rebecca's awesome. She definitely will be teaching again. I loved the animation in her voice. Um, I loved every little bit of it because it just felt like there was just something really beautiful about her showing up as herself and teaching us the scriptures, um, which is what we're all aspiring to do. Amen. Show up as ourselves and whether we're teaching the scriptures or whether we're teaching at our jobs or whether we're learning at our jobs, we're just ourselves, right? She didn't, didn't seem like she was trying very hard last week, did it? There was something admirable about that. There was something profound about that. And it wasn't necessarily because she's a scholar, but because she was herself interacting with the scriptures. And that's what God invites us all to do. Hey, good to see you, Chris Dorman. <laughs> So we're going to recap real quick. I'm going to share a little bit of an overview real quick because there's, um, there's been some things that have occurred that aren't included in the text. And then we're going to jump into some groups and we're going to dive into the text. Um, recap, Pastor Jason um, introduced the book to us with an overview that basically he talked about the main theme within the text is that these guys are returning from exile, from Babylonian exile. Um, to and they're embracing the Lord has brought them back to their homeland to the to the to the city of Jerusalem, and um, He is restoring back to them their way of life after seventy years of captivity in Babylon. Um, I thought one of the most uh, profound things that Jason said the entire night was that exile happens when we we operate out of our own strength. I thought I, it's literally just stuck with me ever since he said it, because he said, we, we don't like to acknowledge that we often are experiencing exile. And I think we experience exile so much more than we want to acknowledge because we don't like to admit we're operating in our own strength. Ugh. Yeah, that's gross. So, and then week one, Pastor Alvin shared with us, I thought he did an incredible job of introducing to us the decree of Cyrus. He talked about how God stirred up a man who was not a follower of Yahweh and stirred him up to bring back the people. And uh, one of the things that I felt that he said in one way or another is that God is more interested in our restoration than we are. And I really felt like that was a profound uh, thought that really got came forth. And that week too, I shared on um, Ezra 3 and 4 and we, we looked into the foundations of the temple and the restoration of the temple and the establishment of it and the foundations that come in the place of renewal. Um, last week, Rebecca shared on prophetic recollection and the power of remembrance. And she asked us to enter into the story and to become characters in the text and to imagine what it would be like to be in the land, in Jerusalem, experiencing the first Passover in their nation in over 70 years. And I thought that it was really, really cool to hear what stories, what thoughts came forward. Um, some scholarly, some imaginative, some, you know, really, really just trying to play the part and dive in um, of what it would have been like for them to celebrate the first Passover in, in Jerusalem. So, as I said, we... Uh, we did chapters one through six. That's our recap, but something really interesting has happened. There is a massive gap in between chapter six and chapter seven, almost 60 years, 58 years. It's in this time period that the book of Esther takes place, okay? So that's something that you wouldn't readily know. It's not mentioned in the text at all in Ezra. Ezra wrote Ezra and Nehemiah. Funny part is, is Ezra doesn't show up until chapter 7. So we're going to meet Ezra tonight, and we're going to talk about who Ezra is and the significance of Ezra. But I think this is very, very interesting because we see almost a, I, wanna, I don't want to say a massive shift, but I perceive it 
in the language that's used in the decree by Artaxerxes, which is the father, the son of Xerxes, the one who Esther would have been with in, 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 in Persia, and that there is an, a tremendous amount of increased favor on the nation of Israel. And so I don't want to neglect that. We're going to go back and we're going to circle back to Esther at the end when we're done with Nehemiah. But I just want to point out that as we're moving forward, we have to pay attention that this has taken place because this is extremely significant. Like this is extremely significant within the course of Israel's history and also their relationship with the nation of Persia moving forward. And so there's a 58-year gap between chapter 6 and chapter 7. The whole book of Ezra covers about 80 years. So 7 to 10 covers just about two years. So very short period. The first, the, the return of Zerubbabel covers about 20 years. So, all right. You guys know the ropes. This is how we do at takeout. I want you to break up into groups. Okay, I know I haven't even done anything. Look at you, you don't even know what to do. You're like, are you teaching us anything tonight, Jordan? And I want you to answer this question. You have the first 10 verses of chapter seven. So hopefully you brought your Bible to Bible study. And I want you to read the first 10 verses in groups of three or four. And I want you to answer this question. Who is this Ezra? That's in quotation marks. You're going to see in the first few verses, there is an emphatic emphasis. I don't know if you can say that, but I'm going to tonight. An emphatic emphasis, a double emphasis. That's right, Cal, on, on Ezra. And it's funny because I think it's hilarious that Ezra is writing this, and he says, this Ezra. <laughs> <laughs> he's not just any old Ezra, he's this Ezra. And so who is this Ezra? Okay? And we're gonna cast we're gonna we're gonna hear our responses five, six, seven minutes, probably till about eight seventeen. So if you look back at the clock, it's eight eleven now. Seven eleven, sorry. Oh hey, shout out. See it they see it they don't see. That's right. It's my favorite Mexican restaurant. Um.
All right, all right, all right, all right. Identify a spokesperson in your group. Identify a spokesperson in your group. This is like class projects, exactly. This is like watershed. Um. <laughs> all right, let's start uh, in the back right. What? Who? Who is this Ezra? Ooh. Ooh. Wow. Okay. I'm going to put a star by that one. <laughs> All right. Who else? Uh, what other groups? Who do you guys got? Uh, we said the same thing. Where was identity? Okay. That's good. That's good. That's good. They got it from you guys, right? Exactly. I figured as much. Yeah. God's hand is on his life. Okay. And that's a quote. So I like that. All right. Who else? You guys. Anything different? Daniel's like, uh. <laughs> He's a Levite. Okay. He's a Levite. You guys said that too? Anything else? Did you have anything else? Describe. Ooh, he had favor. I like that too. All right, anybody else? What are you guys back there? What do you guys have? Say that again. He practiced and taught what he learned. He practiced and taught what he learned. All right, what else? A student and a teacher. I like that. Okay, cool. And teacher. Okay, anybody else have one last thing? Come on. Yes, what you got? Not only did he have favor from the Lord, but he had favor from the king. He had favor from the king. He had favor from a pagan king. Favor from man as well. And we'll say favor from... Awesome. These are all great responses because it's all very, very true. What we see in the first 10 verses is we have this emergence of this man whose name has adorned this book for the last six chapters, and we're finally now getting to meet him. And he introduces himself so eloquently, as many of us do, right? If I were to introduce myself into a historical document, I might do something very similar. Jordan. That's right. I might start there as well, since it's my favorite verse in the Bible. Um, let's go ahead and read the first 10 verses, and I'm going to just point out some fun stuff that's in here. And, um, and I'm going to talk about um, incarnational living, since I think that's one of the big things that we see from Ezra. It says, now after these things, in the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, there went up Ezra, son of Sariah, son of Azariah, son of Hilkiah, son of Shalom, son of Zadok, son of Hattub, son of Amariah, son of Azariah, son of Merioth, son of Zariah, son of Uzi, son of Buki, son of Abishua, son of Phinehas, son of Eleazar, son of Aaron, the chief priest. He has done something that is quite, you know, in my opinion, pretty cool. He puts his name in the lineage of the greatest priests in Israel's history. You might recognize a couple of the names in there. Hilkiah was the famous priest around the time of Josiah, found in Second Chronicles. You might notice the name Zadok is mentioned in there. He's the famous priest during the time of David and also his son Solomon. And then also going back all the way, of course, to Phineas, one of the priests that comes from the line of Aaron as well. And then obviously culminating back in the chief priest, the... Um, the uh, the, uh, what is he, the, the brother of Aaron? Or the brother of Moses? Brother-in-law? What was he? Brother of Moses. Yeah, that's what I thought. The brother of Moses, Aaron, the chief priest. Verse 6. This Ezra. This Ezra 
I just love that. I just feel like he read this in front of the entire nation and he was like, this Ezra, <laughs> don't mind if I do. <laughs> I'm here, everybody. Uh, this Ezra went up from Babylon and he was a scribe skilled in the law of Moses, which the Lord God of Israel had given. And the king granted him all he requested because the hand of the Lord, his God, was upon him. Some of the sons of Israel and some of the priests and the Levites, the singers, the gatekeepers, the temple servants, went up to Jerusalem in the seventh year of King Artaxerxes. He came to Jerusalem in the fifth month, which was in the seventh year of the king. For on the first of the month, he began to go up from Babylon. And on the first of the fifth month, he came to Jerusalem because the good hand of God was upon him. For Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord, to practice it, and to teach his statutes and his ordinances in Israel. What we see in the first six chapters in the return, the first return, remember, this is a trifold return that unfolds over the, of the course of the book of Ezra and also Nehemiah. The third return is our good old friend Nehemiah. Um, and the second return with Ezra what we see take place in the first six chapters, which we've already discussed, is that they come to rebuild the temple. They come to build the temple structure and to be just start the restoration process. What we see after this large 58-year gap with the return of Ezra is we see that God is now sending back to the people his law. Now, the people that are there are already accustomed somewhat to its law. They know it, they've studied it, many of them have probably committed in most of it to memory, but what we see instituted in the book of Exodus and Leviticus is that the law is enforced and is brought into the community of the nation of Israel through the Levitical line and through the high priest that is working in the temple in Jerusalem. And so for all intents and purposes, Zerubbabel came to rebuild the structure and Ezra came to fill it. Does that make sense? He comes to fill it with the law and the enforcement of the law to the nation. Because, listen, the law is extremely significant to the nation of Israel. Not just the temple is significant, but almost more significant than the temple is the law itself. Because the law is what, it, it is essentially, Jay, how would you put it? The law in the sense in Exodus is like when a king takes his domain, what does he do? He establishes a law. Every king, when he would conquer a land or when he would set himself up to be a king, the very first thing that he would do is he would reveal or he would reveal to the people what was the standard of living within his kingdom. And what'd you say? He'd codify culture. See, I knew he would have a good way of just, just summarizing that. Did you see that? He would codify culture. I'm not quite sure what codify means, but I will hold <laughs> to that word. I am going to just say it because I'm just, every time I say it, I feel more separate and I feel like I should have the microphone when I say codify. It just feels like, feels like I just should be here. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, this Jordan will codify culture. You know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> And so when Ezra comes back, the reason why he is the one who's writing all of this and the one who's documenting. <laughs> yeah. What was the word you said about uh, on, on all the charcuterie things you said? Uh, what was that word? It's going to drive me nuts. Well, you said uh, an assortment. What was the other word you used, though? Accoutrements. <laughs> I was at his house one night, and he was like, yeah, you know, me and Dee, we like to create these snack boards. And I was like, oh, that's awesome, with an accoutrement of different items. And I was like, <laughs> I, I don't care. I, I, it, it caught me so off guard. I was like, huh, I don't often eat accoutrements in the evenings. Uh, <laughs> but anyways, uh, Sorry, I love Jason's words. His vocabulary is incredible. Um, so when the law is coming back, get back to the scriptures, Jordan. Help me now, Lord. Help me, help me, help me. 
he is coming to bring the standard of God back to the people. And so this is, an ex- this is very significant, not just for the continuation of restoration, but this is now going to bring about the standard that was supposed to separate the nation of Israel from all other nations. It's not just going to be lived in oral edict in the way that it's just passed on orally amongst the people. Now he's coming back with the physical law in expert in the law from the lineage of the high priest coming in a very, well, we'll see it in chapter eight show up, bringing um, another exodus. This is what all of this is alluding to. It's alluding to another exodus. But I want to point out some things about Ezra that I think are, are really cool. And I think that, um, I want to make this statement. I think we're all Ezra's. Okay. I think that in a way, especially like if we could ever like, if you'd ever wanted to have an Ezra anointing, this might be the region for it. Because there is a, a, there is a, a reality to being able to having favor, not just with any man, but having favor with kings and princes. And because of just the location, the geog- geographical location where we live. And um, I, I think it's really, 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 really cool because we get into this space at the end um, of verse, we get into this place in verse 10 where it says, you know, I think it's probably the, the verse that maybe all of us really were drawn to. I, I read it and was like, oof, this is fire. I like this a lot. This will preach right here. Um, and because I'm a preacher, I'm drawn to those verses. Um, and it says this, For Ezra had set in his heart to study the law of the Lord, to practice it, and to teach his statutes and ordinance in Israel. <laughs> I believe that what Ezra entered into, in a way, is something that we're all invited into this side of the cross, and that's to live in an incarnational way. We all have been invited to the process of learning. That's what it means to be a disciple. Jason pointed that out a couple of weeks ago. I don't even think it was about Ezra or Nehemiah. I think he was talking about the Lord's Prayer when he was talking about the disciples' prayer. And I think that when we all said yes to following the Lord, we entered into a discipleship process. And discipleship means to enter into a learning phase where you are learning. And listen, it doesn't matter. Anybody who's been following the Lord for 10, 20, 30 years understands that you are never stop learning and you never stop relearning and you never stop unlearning all the things you thought you learned before. I've just been telling my wife this. We were having this conversation about, you know, a lot of language from a long time ago. The Lord's used Ezra and Nehemiah and Kelsey and mine's life to communicate the, the movement of revival for decade, for over a decade. When we first moved here, Kelsey had this crazy dream about the third wave and about it being the third final finish to bring about the completion and the movement and all this stuff, right? It was heavenly tabernacle. Oh, okay, well, I can swirl out with you guys afterwards. But the truth is, is, is that we all enter into this process of learning when we say yes to Jesus. The next step comes when we have to do what Nehemiah, or what Ezra does when he says we actually have to practice it. Isn't it funny? You actually don't nail it the first time. Like It requires you to take what you learn and apply it to your life and to live it out. This is the process by which we enter into Revelation God shows us an aspect of himself. He reveals so that we can become like him. We become like him when we practice it. We become like him when we do it, right? When we, we apply what we've learned, the things that have been shown to us. But then I think this is what makes Ezra so profound. And I think this is why we're all really Ezra's. He then doesn't just hold on to it for himself, And I think this is what the Lord is really beginning to show a lot of us in this season. I don't know if you guys are accustomed to the charismatic language of my revelation. You guys know that language? No? Okay, well, that's good. Because that was something that was tossed around quite a bit over the last decade. You might hear people say something like, well, that's just not what I believe according to my revelation. Ooh, this Ezra. (laughs) And so what it becomes is is that when we have this feeling of, well, this isn't what the Lord has shown me, we actually blockade ourselves from receiving from one another. 
And one of the walls that I feel like is being torn down in this hour more than ever as we are entering into our own space of renewal is, is that we're learning how to give away what God has done for us and we're seeing people's hearts receptive to receiving it. And I think that this is where unity comes from. Unity doesn't come from one person with a great idea and everyone's willing to follow. That's not where unity comes from. Unity comes from when we're all willing to follow the man, yes, Jesus, the one man, I guess, but in the process of following him, we're willing to learn and to live and to give to one another around us so that my breakthrough can become your breakthrough and my revelation can become your revelation. And what I'm learning about can be something that maybe you don't, you're not learning about, but by proxy, you can be learning about it. See, as we in, incarnationally live the way Ezra did, we actually see that that's when the hand of God actually comes upon us. Oof. And the anointing of Ezra is that he's not just willing to learn and lord over people. Does that make sense? He's obviously special. This Ezra, from a special lineage, he could have said, well, I'm the only one who knows the law. I obviously am the man who's been anointed to know the law. So all of you shall listen to me and I will tell you what you shall do. But he comes and he's like, I'm going to give the law to you. Does that make sense? This is why Ezra is a reformer. It's, it's similar to why Martin Luther gets called a reformer within church history. His passion for the word of God is what caused him to reform and bring reformation to the church. And do you know one of his biggest passions was to translate the Bible out of Latin into German? You know why? Because it was the language of the culture and everybody could read it then. See, he didn't want to just know the scripture and then hold on to it so that he could become, in an effect, the way the Catholic Church operates in which the priests are the only one that are able to read the scriptures. He was like, no, we need to get the, the teachings of Jesus into the hands of everyone. Amen. <laughs> history buff over here. He's like, yes, yes, teach us the history. You want to talk history, he's the man to talk with. And so one of the things that I really want to pray into tonight at some point is, is that I just want to pray for us to be open to, honestly, I feel like the Lord's going to anoint some Ezra's. I feel like in this day and in this hour, like this is what the Lord is bringing up. It's, listen, we all want revival, sure, right? Listen, I, I'm not, we all want it. I do too. But what I want to see revival do is bring reformation. You know what I mean? Like, I, I can fall on the ground and roll around too, and I have a lot of fun doing it. I've done it, been down on the ground, been out in the spirit, you know, all of those things. I love to shake, bake, and quake. But the truth is, is shake, bacon, and quaking doesn't reform culture. Shake, bacon, and quaking doesn't reform culture. It might Bring a new refreshing spirit of God into your life. That's awesome. But it's not just to, it's to reform you so that you can reform culture. It's not just so that you can continue to go back to the honeypot and get your encounter. Like, those are great, but like, it, it has to become incarnational. It has to become transformative so that you can begin to be the transforming of agent of Jesus in your workplaces, in your government jobs, in your schools, and all of these things. And so personal revival will bring personal reform. And then it will bring about reform wherever you go. And so what we're seeing in these spaces like Asbury College, I didn't even want to bring it up. Gosh darn it. <sighs> I can't help myself. You're right. <laughs> he knows me way too well. I said to myself this morning, I said, I'm not talking about Asbury College tonight. And sure enough, it's coming out of my mouth. Is it revival or isn't it revival? I don't care. Want to know why? Because we won't know if it's revival for five years. Because if it doesn't bring reformation, it was never revival. It was just a good meeting. It was just an outpouring. You want to know what I'm beginning to think revival is? The pool of Bethsaida. A stirring in the water and everybody tries to jump in. The first person in gets their breakthrough. Everybody else? Eh. 
wait till the next one. That episode of The Chosen, I was watching that joint and I was like, oh my gosh, this is revival. And Jesus walks in the midst of revival, walks up to the man and he's like, hey, are you done with this game? Follow me. My question becomes in the midst of these types of things, like are we following revival or are we following Jesus? That's why I don't care. That's why you're not going to catch me driving nine hours to go to Asbury College. I'm so happy for those students. I want them to get everything that they prayed for. Everybody that's trying to jump in and do the deep end like they've been there the whole time. Those guys, I'm like, eh. Hey, listen, I hope it spreads. That's my prayer. I've been praying for revival for over 10 years. But the truth is, is what I've learned from studying revival is that a lot of what we associate with revival actually wasn't revival. Go to Pensacola, right where the church was that experienced revival. Tell me what the surrounding area around that church looks like. It's like the roughest part of the whole city. People are dying all the time. There's people with needles on their arms outside the church building. Revival? I think it was just a really good series of meetings and hunger led the people and that's fine. Those are beautiful things. Some people are offended with me right now. It's okay. All right, keep going, Jordan. Get off your soapbox. <laughs> Some soapboxes are good, but eventually you got to get off them. All right, incarnational living. I just really, really want to drive this home because I feel, you know, listen, this is an introduction to Ezra's return. There is a lot of emphasis on who Ezra is. And I think that if we read about Ezra and think we can't be like him, we won't become like him. But the truth is, is because he does what Jesus does, he incarnates the word and because of it finds favor with God and man, this is the process by which we become disciples. We are disciples of Jesus and we make known the word. I'll never forget, I got a buddy right now who's in a church that he doesn't want to be in. I know, right? Rough life. And um, he's not able to preach. And he preached for years and he's an incredible preacher. And um, I'll never forget, he called up a spiritual dad and he was like, you won't believe it, man. They got me preaching three times a year and they're telling me what to preach on. And he's like, okay. And he's like, man, these messages are so flat and seeker sensitive and so bunk, you wouldn't believe it. He's like, what am I going to do, man? I got, he's like, what? Uh, ah. He's just scrambling. And the guy looks at him and says, well, Southern guy, right? From Shreveport, Louisiana. So he talks like this. And I know him, so I, I can talk like him. Well, I guess you're going to have to start preaching with your life then, won't you? right? We often don't think that way here in the West. We think our words, they're going to argue people into the kingdom. But because we think that way, we rarely make the word incarnate. We rarely live the messages God tells us. But if we did, if we did, if we just stopped thinking that we were going to beat people over the head with the Bible and they were going to get saved or, or, or all of our apologetics, I love apologetics, or all of our truth finding and debunking of science and all of these things are going to be the things that get people to go, aha, or the salinity of the ocean, whatever. You know what I mean? Like I, I've been there. I've been in all of those classrooms. They're incredible. It's incredible facts to learn how science actually does back up the scriptures, but it's, it's never going to win a person into the kingdom. Well, maybe it will, but it's going to be an exception to the rule. What's going to bring people in is you living differently. This is what sets Ezra apart. Listen, Ezra is not just a guy that he was literally walking around the palace one day and was like, ha, huh, where have you been this whole time? No, Ezra was in the, he was in the courts of the king. And he, what most scholars believe is that he was an expert concerning Israel's law. Now you have to remember, they, they took the Jewish people out of them. They didn't stop worshiping Yahweh. They didn't have a temple anymore, but they still are worshiping Yahweh. And so the law of God, and now post Esther, it's even more. Now, now, now not only are they just there, now everybody knows they're there. Now they've got favor with the, with the government, and the government begins to put special experts in his court to help him make sure that the Jewish people's law is protected. And so now he says, yeah, listen, this guy knows his stuff. He's also... 
he doesn't know all of the lineages and stuff like that. He's like, now go back, take the law back to your people. And now don't just, don't just regulate the law here from, from Persia. Take the law back to your people and reestablish the culture of heaven that was given to you guys in the wilderness so many hundreds of years later through the prophet Moses. All right. That was fun, right? Guess not. <laughs> All right. So in chapter, verses 11 through the end of the book, yes, um, we see, if you, if you want to read it, it's so, I think it's so absolutely profound. And I think when holding the idea that Esther has already happened in the backdrop, you just notice just, it's so much different than Cyrus's decree. Cyrus's decree is just kind of like, God stirred me, go. <laughs> Artaxerxes is like, <laughs> according to the law of the God which is in your hands. There's a free will offering of the people from the priests. And he just, it, it, and, and, and it's one of these things where you see now another pagan king giving back to the nation of Israel tangible signs of hope, just like PA mentioned with chapters one and chapter two, tangible signs of hope that God is interested in bringing back to them what separates them from the rest of the other nations of this world. I think it's super cool. He doesn't just give them money. He actually goes, we're going to get all the rest of the temple items, all the gold, all the silver, and we're going to send these back with you as well. Okay? So we see this, and then the last verse 20 says, the rest of the needs of the house of God for which you may have occasion to provide, provide from them from the royal treasury. I think that's awesome. All right, all right, verses 27 to 28. Um, yeah, it says, blessed be the Lord God of our God fathers who's put a such thing as this in the king's heart to adorn the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem and has extended loving kindness to me before the king and his counselors and all the king's mighty princes. Thus, I was strengthened according to the hand of the Lord God, my God, upon me. And I gathered the leading men from Israel to go up with me. All right, chapter eight. Ezra is a scribe, which means he's a good writer, right? I don't know. I can't, I don't tell exactly what it means. I just think he's a good writer, um, which is what scribe means. I'm messing with you guys, but guess not. Um, what we see is, is, is Ezra is now begins to, as soon as he enters the story, of course, right? is this allusion to this mosaic figure. He's the most humble man who's ever walked the earth. And so we see through chapter eight, again, this is just gonna be pretty, pretty just floating over the surface. What we see take place is that we see in chapter seven actually, is that Ezra decides to return on the first day of the first month. He is aligning himself with the Jewish calendar of the Passover. He is leaving on the day that the people would have left Egypt, okay? So the first day of the first month is the day they celebrate the Passover. The day after that would have been the day they were told to leave Egypt. And so Ezra is saying, I too am leading another exodus. And so he is leaving on the same day that they left Egypt. He then alludes to... The, um, I guess that's not the second thing, but the first thing that we see in chapter eight is, is that he appoints the heads of their father's households. In the same way Moses in the wilderness appointed the, from the heads of households to oversee and enforce the law within the community and the nation of Israel, Ezra too is not just bringing back any old Israeli punks. He's bringing back what he would describe as the heads of households. So what he is saying is, is I'm not just bringing back Poor people, I'm bringing back the elite of the elite, the people who are going to help me enforce the law in, in Jerusalem. He then alludes to the material spoils that come, which is, a, is an allusion to us, them leaving Egypt with the spoils of the Egyptians. We see, okay, that's the appointing of leaders. We see this, this is super interesting. Judaism is huge with numbers. I don't know if you guys knew that, but you do now. There is a repeated mentioning of the number 12 throughout the entire, you'll see it, it actually continues even further in the text. You see it with uh, the number of rams that they're offering. It's a derivative of 12. It's like seven times 12. You see with the other one, it's like 
eight times 12. You see that there's 12 sheep offered as a sin sacrifice. He's mentioning this as a repeated allusion back to the 12 tribes of Israel, alluding it back to the completion of God with the nation. And then this, this is where we'll kind of camp here for the end and we'll do another question series is this, is that the Exodus illusion, and this is what is always the illusion within the Exodus stories, within all of the Exodus stories, is that God brings about an Exodus to reestablish worship of him. When Moses goes before Pharaoh, he says, let my people go so they may worship me. Okay, this is about the reestablishment of the correct orderly worship of God from his people, okay? So, I want you to get back in your groups. Oh, actually, we need to keep reading. It's my mistake. Don't ever close your Bible before you're done. There we go. All right, so what we see is, is that they're leaving the nation of, of Persia. He selected the heads of the families, and um, you see that there's also a couple other allusions. They're at the river of Ahava for three days. That's an allusion to Joshua chapter two, where they're standing before they wait three days. They cast a fast. He says, consecrate yourselves, go in. But I want to I wanna focus in on this section 21 to verse, yeah, 23. It says this, they're about to continue on in their journey after he has gone and, and sent to, he notices when he's looking at the people, he ain't got no Levites. That's a really poor way to say that. My mom would correct me. You can't say ain't got no. That just sounded horrible. They didn't have any Levites in their crew. So he's like, uh, we got to find some Levites because guess what? Levites are the ones that take care of all the, te the temple dwellings. So if we don't have this, we don't have God's presence. If we don't have God's presence, how are we going to enforce the law? So he goes and he goes and finds about 38, 38 Levites. But... God cares about those 38 men, and he sends them with them. But this is what I think is interesting. He says in verse 21, he says, Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river Ahava, that we might humble ourselves before our God to seek from him a safe journey for us, our little ones, and all our possessions. For I was ashamed to request of the king's troops and horsemen to protect us from the enemy on the way, because we had said to the king, The hand of our God is favorably disposed to all those who seek him, but his power and his anger are against all those who forsake him. So we fasted and sought God concerning this matter, and he listened to our entreaty. I find this to be quite funny because it's like he kind of wished he had some protection. And he was like, Uh, I already told him that, like, our God's so powerful we don't need protection. And like, I've done this before. That's why I laughed so hard when I read it. When I moved here, God, I, God audibly spoke to me when I was in Whitewater, Wisconsin to tell me to move to Washington, D.C. I had never been to Washington, D.C., and I didn't even really know where Washington, D.C. was on the map since I went to Google Maps about a month after it had launched, and I was scouring the state of Washington looking for it. Wisconsin has better education than that. I was drunk in the spirit, all right? Uh... <laughs> When I tell that story, people are like, uh, did you go to school? Um, and I'm like, I did. I was drunk in the Holy Ghost, all right? I didn't even know what that was then. And I remember telling everybody the whole time, don't worry, I'm going to Washington, D.C., and I'm not going to fail. Because if I fail, it'll be God's fault. And so when I read this, the, well, I've been reading it for the last couple of days, but when I read it, I laughed because I was like, oh, Ezra, oh, how I know what this feeling feels like to be like, oh, I can't ask for any help because I've already told them God's moving me to Washington, D.C., and I don't need any help. He's help moving there. Yeah, I, I needed a lot of help, actually, and I ended up just kind of almost not making it because I told everybody I didn't need their help. Sound familiar, right, Jay? Uh, <laughs> so I'm, I, I laugh because I think there's this, well, Nehemiah chapter two, Nehemiah gets a full escort back to the land. And so Ezra's like, I don't need it. So, but I want to focus in on, on, on their, on their seeking of protection. I feel like one of the things that the Lord is revealing in this hour to myself and to many of us is this idea of self-protection is that self-protection is how we maintain ourselves. But what we notice in this is, is that Ezra's like, I actually got a really dangerous road ahead of me. 
And that, it really was. It was, it was, a, it was a four-month journey from Persia to Jerusalem. So it's not like these guys were like a 12-hour road trip. Like, they were going to be walking for four months in a caravan. And along that road, you have to imagine, they're not Persians. They might be walking through the Persian Empire, but they're not Persian. It was filled with ambushes and robbers and burglars. And these guys are carrying the king's gold. So it's not like they don't have this giant target on their back. I also thought it was kind of interesting. Ezra was like, hey, we're not going to do this. Like, I picture this like a motorcycle gang. And you just have to get inside my brain for a moment. He's like, listen, we got all this product. We got to split it up between all 12 of you, okay? Because guess what? When the 5 O's show up, 11 of you are going that way, and one guy's going that way. That guy's getting caught, and we'll lose a little bit of the gold, but we're not going to lose all the gold. That's how I read it. This is it. That's exactly right, right? Like you heard that and you're like, that's exactly what he did. That's brilliant. He was like sons of anarchy before sons of anarchy. <laughs> um, but I want you to group up and I want you to share stories about times that you've experienced the protection of the Lord. Okay? Because I think sharing a story or a testimony about the protection of the Lord will also allow us to then pray for one another. And that's what I want you to do. I want you to pray that they would experience the keeping and the protection of the Lord. Because I really believe that where we're headed as a church and what we're all being personally invited to in this hour, because listen, like I don't have five people bringing up to me in the last three weeks that the atmosphere feels pregnant with revival and then Asbury breaks out last week because there's not something shifting in the atmosphere around us. It's happening, but what we need to now do is, is it's going to require us to be ourselves. Like the anointing doesn't fall on a performed version of yourself. If it does, it will crush you, which is why God withholds the anointing while you're performing. I have experienced this firsthand. But when you step into your true self, really what we saw Rebecca Rogers do last week in such a beautiful way, and like, honestly, like, she doesn't do that all the time. Not anymore. She was a teacher once, but like now she's just, she's a stay-at-home mom, right? And she just stepped into her true self, and it was like the anointing fell on it, and I was like, oh, it's beautiful. But it's going to require us to trust the Lord to protect us in a really, really extreme way, because unless we feel safe, we're not going to be our true selves. It's just, it's why we need to create such a safe place for all of us, a judgment-free zone, right? Like the scriptures ask of us, like Jesus creates a judgment-free zone, which is why so many people who we would deem as unholy were like, I got to be around this guy. They felt safe to be themselves. They felt divinely protected in their mess. They weren't hiding their mess. They didn't have to. What would it be like to step into church and not have to hide your mess? I'm hoping for that day. I'm hoping that that day is even already here in some regard. So I want you to just break into groups, share stories of where you have felt divinely protected, or maybe you've never felt protected by God. And if that's the case, I want them to, I want people, I want you to have the rest of your group members pray for you, okay? All right, love you guys.
30 seconds and we're going to pray. All right, final remarks, and then I'm going to pray for you guys. I think the obvious thing, you guys are fine. You can talk. Finish up. Never going to be mad that the people are talking. I know. We can, we can continue to talk and pray for a little while afterwards. I just want to give some final remarks, and then I want to bless you guys. I want to pray for a couple of things. The, the final remark, and I think we'll see this as this moves forward, but we really see it through the introduction through Ezra, is, is that full restoration is impossible apart from the word of God. And so really in our own lives, I think one of the things that Pastor Alvin's really been pushing in, and, and I don't even think he knows how prophetic he is. Can I just be 100% honest with you? As a guy who talks to him kind of regularly, um, I don't think he even knows how prophetic he is. And so when he's like, I think we just need to start memorizing scripture over a year ago, I'm like, uh, what is this, Awana? Like, uh, I'm confused. Like, uh, I love Awana, but I'm not 11 anymore. Um, I don't get a token when I get this memorized anymore. <laughs> uh, what'd you say? Token's coming? <laughs> yes. Can we get the little pog containers to hold them to? No, some of y'all don't even know what I'm talking about. Um, but final thoughts is that full restoration is not possible apart from the word of God. And that God's hand in presentness is God's protection for you. And one of the things that we'll, we, we can see in, the, in, cha in chapter 8 is this, is that it starts with Ezra having the hand of God upon him. When he invites the rest of the people who are traveling with him to enter into the prayer and the fasting with him, it says that when they make it to Jerusalem, the hand of God was over us. It moves from a singular focus of the hand of God being on one man to the hand of God being over the entire group of people. And that's the anointing that all of you get to walk in. The hand of God is on you. And when you invite other people into just simple ways of living, it doesn't even have to be, it's not like you can get everybody at work to fast and pray. Well, maybe you can. Intermittent fasting is a big thing right now. But anyways, all that to say, if you can just have the hand of God in your community where you're at, it'll watch the entire hand of God will begin to cover the entire group you're with because you're in it with them. Okay? And so as we move forward, there's a huge emphasis on the word of God and the law being reestablished. And just know this, that your own restoration can't be complete. It can't be full without the word of God. And so if you are, are feeling that renewal, that restorative power that God is bringing, I believe, into our community and to a whole lot of communities across this earth, um, like the word of God has to become a part of you. And so if you don't have a hunger for it, I, I'm going to pray right now that God would just begin to create inside of you. And I just want you to know it doesn't necessarily have to look the way it did when you first got saved. When I first got saved, I used to read like for two hours straight the scriptures every single day. I was in love with the word of God. Now I'm still in love with the word of God, but I don't read for two hours every day. Wish I had that time, praise the Lord. Um, but I have about... 20 minutes of solid time every day that I can set aside. And I've been doing it ever since the new year. I got into a little bit of a squabble with my ways of, of staying disciplined and reading the word over the last couple of years during the pandemic because the Lord told me I could, to be honest with you. It was a part of him teaching me that he wasn't going to leave me even if I wasn't doing what I thought I needed to do. Does that make sense? He said, stop reading the word. I said, well, what, what, how, how's our relationship going to flow? And he said, Jordan, the word's written on your heart. I was like, oh, okay. 
And then he started reading scripture to me. That's a fun thing. If you want to enter into that, just say, hey, Lord, I'm going to stop reading the scriptures. Would you start reading them to me? I would wake up and the Lord would be reading me scriptures that I have not read in years and years and years. And I'd be like, I'd be in the shower and I would start quoting scripture out of my mouth while I'm showering of passages that I don't have committed to memory. But the Lord's reading it in my head and I can hear him talking and I can reiterate what he's saying. But all that to say, the word of God is not going to, it has to be a part of your life if, as you're as you're moving into this place of being restored like Pastor Alvin has has just released to our church. So go ahead. Let's just put our hands out in front of us like we're going to receive a gift. I believe that the Lord just really wants to anoint our hearts and our minds as we move forward into this week and uh, and, and, and just encounter the full measure of the text, not just through words, but also through spirit. So Lord, we thank you. Hmm. We thank you for your people, Lord. We thank you for your hand that's on our lives. We thank you, Father, for the people we interact with and we engage with on a daily basis, Lord. We thank you for putting those people so divinely in our path. Lord, I ask that we would experience a divine sense of your protection like never before. That, Lord, our hearts would feel safe and our hearts and our minds would perceive that safety so that we feel safe enough to open ourselves up and to be our true selves. The good, the bad, the ugly in the midst of the house and the family of God. Lord, I ask for an increased hunger right now in the name of Jesus for your word. Lord, I ask that with people's appetites increased that you would begin to bring it to memory and remind them that you would begin to read into people's heads the way you've read into mine the scriptures over the years so that the scriptures never leave my mind and never leave my focus. And Jesus, I anoint right now. I ask that you would just bring the anointing of Ezra on our lives. That, Lord, that we would be people that live out your law because not because we, we know the paper, but because it's written on tablets of flesh. That, Lord, that your will would go forward, it would lead our lives, and through that, the law of your, of, 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 of your heart would be permeate the culture and the people around us. Jesus, I ask that you would just anoint us as Ezra's in this time, in this region, in this community. And, Lord, I pray, Lord, as that anointing comes, I pray that the, the favor is not squandered that we don't use the favor for our own good. But we allow your name to be magnified in the midst. So Jesus, we bless you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Our closest friend. Our Father, the one who keeps us safe. Spirit of God, the transformative power of Jesus inside of us, would you just come? Be with us. Tabernacle with us in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Love y'all. Thanks for coming.